My name is Haley Sinoff. I'm a senior in sociology and political science. I've been involved with the Campus Climate Coalition and some other local climate justice groups for a few years now. Yeah, hi everyone. I'm Jesse Thompson. I'm a sophomore studying environmental engineering. And I'm also a member of the Campus Climate Coalition and an active participant in sustainability efforts on campus. Uh, our goal today is to discuss the movement to divest from fossil fuels with an expert on the intricacies of climate science and investment, Bill McKibben. Before we begin, we want to remind everyone that MSU sits on the land that has sheltered many indigenous people throughout time, among them the Crow, the Blackfeet, the Eastern Shoshone, the Salish, the Pendere, the Kootenai, the Grovant, the Chippewa, the Cree, the Cayuse, the Coeur d'Alene, and the Nez Perce. We will start this event by hearing from Bill for 40 minutes and then move on to a question and answer opportunity for 30 minutes. This event is sponsored by the student-led Campus Climate Coalition, the MSU Leadership Institution Change Makers Program. Additional sponsorship comes from the MSU Office of Sustainability, the MSU Department of Political Science, the Montana Institute on Ecosystems, Sustainability Now, Gallatin Sunrise, the University of Montana Climate Change Studies Program, and the UM Climate Response Club. The MSU Campus Climate Coalition was formed in 2020 to advocate for intersectional climate justice and institutional change. It is currently engaged in a new Montana State University Alumni Foundation working group consisting of foundation board members, students, and university representatives with the goal of aligning the university's endowment with MSU's goals of carbon neutrality. The group is committed to thoughtfully negotiating a delicate investment landscape to find a more profitable, sustainable, and fossil-free MSU endowment. World-renowned environmentalist, author, and journalist Bill McKibben has written, has written extensively on the impact of global warming and has long been a hero of mine. His 1989 book, The End of Nature, was one of the first books on climate change aimed at a general audience, and his writings appear regularly in outlets such as The New Yorker and The Rolling Stones. He is the founder of a nonprofit environmental advocacy group, 350.org, and organized protests against Keystone Cell Pipeline Project. He's a Schumann Distinguished Scholar in Environmental Studies at Middlebury College and a fellow of American Acad Academy of Arts and Sciences. He has received the Gandhi Peace Prize and the Right Livelihood Award, and was named a Foreign Policy's 2009 list of the world's 100 most important global thinkers. Congressional Representative Jamie Raskin recently commented, quote, if we survive the interlocking plagues of climate change, right-wing authoritarianism, savage inequality, Future generations will utter the name of the New England moral visionary and activist McKibben with reverence we speak of Emerson, Thoreau, and Garrison, unquote. It's through work like McKibben's that I'm reminded this is a really excited time to be alive. We're going through so much change and there's so many passionate, innovative minds out there and I find this passion truly contagious. So it's with great pleasure that I welcome to Montana State for the first time, Bill McKibben. Well. Thank you both for that very, very kind introduction. How I wish I was actually in Bozeman uh, today in order to watch the spring come over the, um, over the mountains. Um, it's one of my favorite places on earth and y'all are very lucky to be there. Um, I know it's a big weekend in uh, Bozeman. I know the rodeo starts tomorrow. I know everybody's still in a good mood from uh, winning the both ends of the Big Sky Tournament on the court. Uh, for me, uh, for those of us who, um, who love above all uh, uh, skiing, Nordic skiing, um, I just want to shout out to um, an old student of mine, Sophia Laukley, who transferred to MSU last year and went on to win the NCAA uh, uh, race uh, uh, um, this year uh, at the championships, uh, one of the great skiers in America, and a uh, and a and a stellar student, I must say, in my global warming class uh, a year ago. So, um, it's a real pleasure to be with you all. We're going to talk about fossil fuel today, um, in and we're going to talk about it in many ways. Just beginning with the reasons that it might be worth thinking about dissociating oneself with it. To begin with, though, credit where due. Uh, fossil fuel was the engine that drove modernity. It explains most of the world that we see around us. For the last 200 years, it's been the most important force on planet Earth. 
uh, when we learn to use coal and then oil and gas, it's as if each of us suddenly acquired uh, a thousand servants to do our bidding, those of us in the Western world anyway, um, because the incredible densely concentrated energy in a barrel of oil or a ton of coal can do an extraordinary amount of work. And that work is reflected in the wealth and the prosperity and the ease uh, and pretty much everything we take for granted in the world around us. So that's the first thing to say. Uh, fossil fuel is has done an extraordinary amount to liberate human beings in lots of ways, to make it able for us to travel, uh, to make it able for us to stay up late at night, for make us uh, able to um, um, do so many of the things that we do. So that's the first point. The second point is, we're actually at a moment in human history when that dependence is no longer necessary. That is to say, over the last 50 years, and particularly over the last decade, scientists and engineers, probably most of them in the United States, have figured out how to replace the burning of coal and gas and oil with other forms of power that can do the job. I just finished a um, long and and piece for the New Yorker magazine that went fairly viral. Um, and the premise of the piece was that we have reached the point in human history when we now can make full use, not of the fires we set on our own, not of burning coal and gas and oil, but of the fact that the good Lord put a large ball of burning gas 93 million miles away up in the sky, and we now know how to use it. The price of energy generated by solar panels, which captures those rays directly, and by wind turbines, which capture the breeze that's set up by the differential heating of the earth, um, um, we now, the, the, the price of those have dropped 90% in the last decade, along with the batteries to store that power when the sun goes down or the wind drops. This is now the cheapest way to produce energy across most of the planet. And that's very good news. It means that there's no longer a technical nor financial obstacle to making rapid change. Why would we want to make rapid change off fossil fuel? Let me give you three reasons. The first of those reasons, the first of those reasons is <clears throat> that Burning stuff, if you can avoid it, uh, is a good idea. Um, a big, massive study last year found that about 9 million people a year die on this planet from breathing the combustion byproducts of fossil fuel. That is to say, just the, um, uh, the, the particulates and the smoke and whatever that comes out of the backs of um, uh, uh, cars, out of power plants, out of the gas fire in your um, kitchen, uh, 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 on and on and on. Nine million people a year. To give you some perspective, nine million people is more people than died last year from around the world from COVID, HIV AIDS, malaria, tuberculosis, war, and terrorism combined. And those deaths are now unnecessary because we know how to replace the things that are causing them, the coal, the gas, the oil, with, <clears throat> with electricity that we can generate cleanly. Hence, the electric uh, vehicle. The, as you know, the Ford F-150, most popular vehicle in the world, the electric version is going on sale this month. Um, uh, you may not know, but you should, that we can now replace, and millions of people are replacing, the oil and gas furnaces in their basements with air source heat pumps, which take the ambient heat in the air outside and use electricity to use it to heat your home. They're sometimes three or 400% more efficient than, um, than the burners they replace. <clears throat> this is, this, this incredible benefit to public health is often overlooked as a fact of fossil fuel, 
but it's one that we should bear in mind. The second reason we should be thinking about getting off fossil fuel and doing it as fast as we can is because fossil fuel in practice turns out to benefit despots around the world. Um, we can see this very clearly right now in the hideous war being waged in the Ukraine. Vladimir Putin gets 60% of his export earnings from selling oil and gas to the rest of the world. You can tell this is true because, uh, you know, go home and search through your dorm or your apartment or your home to try and find something of Russian manufacture that you could boycott or something. You won't find anything unless maybe there's an old bottle of Stolichnaya sitting at the back of the liquor cabinet or something. Um, Russia essentially is just a big gas station. That's why they're able to afford an army of the size they have now doing its best to pillage Ukraine. And oil and gas have also been the weapon that Putin used to make Western Europe cower for a generation. His threat to turn off the taps was the reason he kept being able to bully people and build his power over time. I've spent some of the last month working with my uh, old friend and colleague Svetlana Romanko, who's been in the middle of Ukraine, uh, bombs falling around her and continuing to do this work to highlight the fact that we need to get off fossil fuel for not for, for, for reasons uh, of environment, but also for reasons of geopolitics, as she says, fossil fuel is a weapon of mass destruction. And it's not just Putin. Because fossil fuel is concentrated in a few places around the world, the people who control or live on top of those deposits end up with more power than they deserve. So uh, Vladimir Putin's one example, but so is the king of Saudi Arabia. Uh, you know, why would we pay attention to these guys? They behead their opponents with swords. I mean, they're not really great participants in the modern world, but because they have so much oil, we have to pay attention to them. Um, same is true of vast companies like Exxon and things that have used their money and political power to deform our democracies. Um, the advantage of sun and wind is that they're everywhere. No one has control over them and nobody can stop them. Vladimir Putin is unable to embargo the sun. The king of Saudi Arabia can't cut off people's supply of wind. So it's a very different world if we moved off fossil fuel. The third reason to move off fossil fuel and the truly existential one is what's happening to the climate of the one planet that we have. I wrote the first book about climate change back in 1989. So I'm well aware that that was long before most of you were born. Um, what we were offering then as warnings about what would happen if we didn't get off coal and oil and gas um, are now coming true because we didn't get off coal and oil and gas. And so we're seeing what it looks like to start warming up a planet. And it is not a pretty picture. So far, we've increased the temperature of the earth about one degree Celsius. And the effects of that already have been enormous. It's about 1.8 degrees Fahrenheit. We've lost most of the sea ice in the summer Arctic. And in the process, managed to deform both the jet stream and the Gulf Stream. Um, because the temperature differentials between the equators and the poles are much less than they were before. Um, we've dramatically changed the planet's hydrological cycle already, the way that water moves around the planet. Uh, if you wanted one fact to remember about climate change, it's that, and really maybe the most important fact of this century, it's that warm air holds more water vapor than cold. That means that in arid, dry areas or seasons, you get more evaporation uh, and hence more drought and combined with heat. That leads to the condition that you guys have been observing um, summer after summer now, vast forest fires on a scale that we have not seen before. 
But once that water is evaporated up in the atmosphere, it's going to come down and it comes down in wet areas in deluge and flood like we've never seen. I was in New York City in August when they had the biggest rainstorm in New York City history, the remnants of Hurricane Ida smashed all the old records. Uh, not only that, it killed a bunch of people, mostly poor people living in illegal basement apartments where they drowned when the water filled their bedrooms um, in the richest city in the world. It's a good reminder that it's always the poor and most vulnerable who suffer first and foremost. Climate change is a huge justice issue. Um, um, the less you did to cause it, the sooner and the harder you suffer. The entire continent of Africa has produced only about 2% of the world's carbon emissions, but they're the ones taking it most on the chin from the rise in temperatures. And of course, this is ongoing all the time. Um, the week before last, temperatures in the Antarctic reached 70 degrees Fahrenheit above normal. That's the equivalent of it being, I don't know, uh, 130 degrees or something in, in Bozeman today. I mean, just in, in insane numbers. Uh, the largest deviation from normal we've ever observed on planet Earth. The same day, the temperature at the North Pole was about 40 degrees Fahrenheit above normal. Things are changing fast and dangerously. As I said, we've raised the temperature one degree so far. And on a current course, we're on track to raise it about three degrees Celsius, five to six degrees Fahrenheit. If we let that happen, then we will not have civilizations like the ones we're used to. The rate of change, chaotic, violent flux is simply too much. Uh, the UN estimates that that would produce a billion climate refugees. I mean, look how the world is struggling with the people pouring out of Ukraine at the moment and then multiply it by 300 times. Um, the economists tell us that that would do economic damage of about $550 trillion, which is more money than currently exists on planet Earth. So we can't let that happen. We have an all out fight to try and hold the increase in global temperature to two degrees Celsius or less. It's gonna be very hard to do it. We have to make all the choices right from this point on and we have to move with real speed the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has told us that we need to have cut emissions in half by 2030. So we have an extraordinary existential problem, climate change, and two huge other problems, the vast public health disaster at 9 million deaths a year and the geopolitical disaster that comes from a world that relies on a scarce resource like fossil fuel. And we have a solution to solve it. Um, the rapid conversion to clean energy, to sun, wind, batteries, uh, at an affordable price gets us where we need to go. So why aren't we doing it? Why aren't we moving faster than we are? Well, the answer, of course, is some combination of inertia, which is always a force in human affairs, and more importantly, toxic vested interest from the fossil fuel industry. Um, we know now from great investigative reporting in places like the Los Angeles Times, or from the Columbia Journalism School, and many others, we know that the fossil fuel industry knew everything there was to know about climate change back 30, 40 years ago, back in the 1980s. Companies like Exxon, then the biggest company in the world, had great staffs of scientists. Their product was carbon. Of course they were studying it. And what they found was the same thing the NASA scientists and others studying it found. Uh, in fact, Exxon scientists told their executives with incredible accuracy in the 1980s what the temperature would be in 2020 how high the CO2 concentration would be in the atmosphere. They predicted it correctly and they were believed. Exxon, for instance, began building all its drilling rigs higher to compensate for the rise in sea level that they knew was coming. But what they didn't do was tell the rest of us. Instead, across the industry, 
They worked to build a kind of architecture of deceit and denial and disinformation. It's kept us locked for 30 years in a completely sterile debate about whether or not climate change was real, a debate both sides knew the answer to at the beginning. It's just one of them was, well, willing to lie, and a very consequential lie it was. At this point, that lie is unsustainable. And so in the last few years, the industry rhetoric has changed to, uh, yes, it's real. In fact, the forest outside your house is on fire, but we need to go very slowly and we don't want to do anything precipitous and so on. They're continuing to defy the science that, that the world's climate scientists are putting forward and to do it effectively. You may notice that um, um, the Biden administration's efforts to pass uh, climate legislation, the first climate legislation that Congress would ever pass, uh, came very close to passing, but they've been held up by one vote, and that vote belongs to Senator Manchin from West Virginia. I bring it up here because Senator Manchin has taken more money from the fossil fuel industry than anybody else in Washington. Not an easy contest to win, but he won it, and their return on investment has been enormous. So add to the list of things that the fossil fuel industry does those two. One, they deform our democracy, um, purchasing politicians. And two, uh, they've deformed the intellectual debate uh, for 30 years. I think that's a particularly important point, I'll just add, for people at universities. If students or professors at universities had behaved in that way, i.e., um, hiding what they knew about the truth and indeed uh, uh, concocting an alternate version that they knew to be incorrect, well, that would get you, um, I don't know what the honor code exactly at MSU is, but that would be enough to get you kicked out and it should be. Uh, it's an insult to intellectual honesty, which is the bedrock of the work that we do at colleges and universities. So for all these reasons, we've had to try and figure out over the years ways to try and stand up to this industry, break some of its political power so that we can adopt the rational, obvious, affordable solutions that scientists and engineers have provided us with. And one of the techniques that we've been using to try and do this work is this campaign around divesting from fossil fuel. Divesting just means selling your stock. Um, um, and not all at once. People have told people to take their time to make the announcement that they're doing it, but to take five years if it needs to, to make sure that they're not selling at the bottom of the market or so on. Um, the divestment campaign is modeled on the campaign from the 1980s to divest institutions from involvement in South Africa because of its racist apartheid political system. And that was very effective. Nelson Mandela, when he finally got out of prison, the first trip that he made was to the US and he didn't go first to the White House. He went first off to California to thank students there in a vast rally representing students all around the country to say that the hundreds of educational institutions that had divested from fossil fuel had played a huge role in helping win the liberation of black South Africans. When we decided to try this with fossil fuel about a decade ago, the first person we called was Mandela's old um, accomplice, uh, Archbishop Desmond Tutu, the leader of Christian South Africa. And he said, Yes, please take up this tool again. Climate change is the human rights issue of our era because of its effect on the poorest and most vulnerable in the same way that apartheid was a generation ago. And so we went to work on this divestment campaign and it has grown very large. It's become the largest corporate campaign of its kind in history. We're now at about $40 trillion in endowments and portfolios that have divested from fossil fuel. 
And those include vast pension funds, um, huge entire religious denominations. The Vatican has been very outspoken in favor of divestment. It also includes many, if not most, of the world's great colleges and universities. So, I mean, the list is very long. Uh, Oxford, Cambridge, Harvard, the University of Michigan, which, you know, is only a few miles down the road from the biggest automobile factories in the world, in somewhat the same way that MSU is in proximity to uh, uh, um, big fossil fuel deposits. It makes it harder in such places because there's even more political power lined up on the other side, but it shouldn't make it impossible. Um, um, the University of California system divested $90 billion, its endowment and also its huge pension fund from fossil fuel. These institutions have been willing to do this for a number of reasons. One, first and foremost, students, faculty, demanded it. Uh, and it took hard protest and effort at almost all these schools to make it happen. Um, um, so that was the sine qua non, people raising these questions around climate change and really asking these institutions if they wanted to continue to try profiting off the end of the planet. And that argument, that moral argument was very deep and strong. But there also have emerged over time uh, a series of very strong practical arguments for doing it. And they center on the fact that uh, fossil fuel has not proven to be a long-term good investment. Indeed, over the last 10 years, it's underperformed every other part of our economy. It's only right at this moment, thanks to Vladimir Putin, that it has a little bounce in its step. Um, um, but that's really not the reason you'd want its value to be going up. The, the reason that it's performing economically badly is twofold. One, um, because it's wrecking the planet, it's coming under more and more regulatory pressure around the world. And we can see more coming down the road. Uh, uh, of finally, we're waking up to the role that fossil fuel is playing, and so there's a lot of pressure on it. Secondly, as I said earlier, people are figuring out a better, cheaper, cleaner way to deliver the same product, energy. You could see these two trends converging on Monday when the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, IPCC, the world's body of climate scientists that study uh, and report on our, our particular peril, issued its most recent working group report. And it detailed the fact that sun and wind are now ready to take um, center stage. And as a result, Antonio Guterres, who's the Secretary General of the UN, and really the closest thing that the planet as a whole, I guess, has to a spokesman, uh, the politician whose jurisdiction is the whole earth. Uh, he said, because of this, and I'll quote from him, it's now economically and morally insane to invest in new fossil fuel. But of course, that's what the companies that an endowments like MSU are invested in are doing. They're out there looking for new oil fields, new coal fields, new ways to exploit old coal, oil and gas fields. They're doing all that they can politically to hold up the transition to renewable energy. Earlier this year, or last year, uh, Exxon's chief lobbyist was filmed uh, uh, um, boasting about the fact that his company had used a variety of tactics to make sure that change never came. They'd pretended, he said, to be in favor of a carbon tax because they knew it couldn't pass Congress, but it would take the heat off them to do anything else. He described Joe Manchin as the kingmaker and said that he met with him every week in, in order to make sure he stayed on side. That's what these companies do, and that's what um, 
MSU or anybody else who invests in them is underwriting. Now, sometimes um, universities and their boards, who after all are, are charged with the well-being of the institution and, and take that seriously. I, I've been on the boards of colleges and universities and I know how seriously trustees take it, including their fiduciary responsibility to the endowment. Um, and sometimes they say, uh, uh, that this needs to be held separate or away or neutral. Um, that's a bad idea for, I think, two reasons. One is the financial one I outlined already. Had places like MSU divested when we first suggested it a decade ago, they'd have more money for more scholarships and more whatever it is that, that, that the university needs money for. Um, um, the other reason is that it's not intellectually sensible to consider the endowment apart from the other facilities of the university. MSU is rightly proud of its commitment to greening the campus, and to building LEED certified buildings, and to doing all that kind of work, as well it should be. Um, that's very important work and important, among other things, in educational terms, because it means that each new generation of undergraduates who pass through are exposed to how what modern architecture can do, for instance, uh, and what energy conservation looks like. Um, but the endowment is just another part of the university. It's no different than the dorms or the gymnasium or the vehicle fleet or anything else. If you're trying to reduce the global warming impact of those things, then it makes no sense to separate out uh, uh, the university's money because that's just another part of the university. Um, um, and why it would get special treatment defies um, defies well, doesn't makes no intellectual sense. And theoretically, making intellectual sense is one of the reasons that we uh, have universities. So the other question that people often ask is, is it effective to divest from fossil fuels? Uh, does it put pressure on these companies? And the answer is yes, it's an effective form of activism. In fact, academic studies have found that it may have been the most effective form of activism over the last decade, keeping into focus climate change and on these other issues. Um, um, uh, Shell Oil, two years ago, said that in their annual report that divestment had become a material risk to its business, which frankly I thought was good news to hear because Shell's business is a material risk to life on planet Earth. Hasn't been the whole, you know, for all 200 years of Shell's history. For much of that time, it performed useful service in bringing us what we needed. But now we don't need it anymore. And now it is causing huge trouble. So now is the time to move past it. And this is one of the ways to do it. Um, there also are people who say we'd be better served by holding our stock in these companies and engaging with these companies in order to get them to make change. Um, that's definitely what the oil companies would like people to do, to go on in the sort of endless, fruitless 30-year debate that they've been underwriting all this time. But there's no real sign that it'll be effective. In fact, just the opposite. Shareholder engagement is a useful tool in many cases. And those cases are usually ones where there's something a little wrong with the business plan. Well, Apple is paying its Chinese workforce slave labor wages. 
So people get together and put pressure on the company and they raise the pay of those workers and the price of an iPhone goes up two and a half bucks and everybody's happy. There was a flaw in their business plan. It got corrected. The problem with the fossil fuel industry is there's not a flaw in the business plan. The flaw is the business plan. They don't know how to do anything really, but dig stuff up and set it on fire. They keep pretending that they do. If you watched Exxon's commercials, you'd think it was an algae company that happened to have a few oil wells someplace, but really the future of their business was algae. They were going to grow algae and turn it into oil on and on and on and on. Well, it turns out that they've spent more advertising the algae than figuring out how to do anything with it because they know it's not an important thing. Even if in 2025 their uh, ambitions come true, they'll be producing about 10,000 barrels of algae oil, which is the tiniest rounding error. They continue to spend upwards of 90% of their capital expenditure budget, not on renewable energy, but on the same old dirty stuff. So it's a very good moment to be asking these questions about disengagement, about moving on um, to, to the next forms of energy, about providing the finance that will bring them online, <clears throat> uh, and about providing what we need for a just transition away from those fuels. Because remember, the people who've spent their lives working in the oil fields or in the coal fields, well, this is not their fault in any way. Uh, the world needed what they knew how to do once upon a time. And now through no fault of their own, the world needs them to stop before the temperature gets too high. So there is a deep need and it's reflected in that Biden bill that Senator Manchin is now preventing from passage for what we've been calling just transition, uh, a, a, a way to um, make sure that those workers are taken care of retrained if they're young enough for that to be a possibility and and uh, given a dignified retirement if they're not. And that's only right and only just. And it can only happen when we manage to diminish the political power of these industries. Let me wrap up because I know I'm rattling on here um, by saying divestment is by no means the only work that needs to happen. It's one front among several in this fight, but it's a very good reminder that all of us have a role to play. Not everybody lives right next to an oil well or a coal mine, but everybody lives adjacent to a pot of money, uh, a university endowment, a church fund, a pension fund that can be used, leveraged to make real change in the time that we have. And universities, seems to me, are particularly called upon to do this because our job at colleges and universities, and I work at one that happily has long since divested from fossil fuel, uh, an endowment larger than, than MSUs, um, our job there is to prepare people for the future. And normally what that means is, um, well, I mean, the kind of logic of the university is, uh, Young people come in and old people tell them things. Fair enough, you know, theoretically, we've acquired some wisdom over the course of our lives and we're more than willing to share it. But in this case, at least the moral authority rests with students because, uh, you know, well, because I'm going to be dead before climate change is at its absolute worst. But if you're in college now and we do not get this under control, when we reach what is supposed to be the prime of your career, it's not going to matter what career you are training for, your job is going to be disaster response because that's what's going to be going on on planet Earth. So the moral authority here rests with younger people. And boards of trustees and you know uh, 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 people who manage endowments and things need to realize that, that this is a special case, the biggest crisis that human beings have ever found themselves in. And that means that we need to pull out all the stops to get it done, especially 
especially at the universities where we first learned what this problem was about. It was in the labs and the supercomputers of American colleges and universities that we really came to understand the global warming dilemma for the first time. And so it's sad that they continue to um, invest in precisely the companies that their own courses, their own teachers, their own researchers have shown are a grave threat. But it also means that it's an enormous opportunity for these institutions to provide both a good financial boost to the cause of getting this off dirty energy, but also to the kind of intellectual and moral understanding in the communities around them. This is a place where universities should play a leading role, a kind of vanguard role. So I am incredibly grateful to the students and faculty at MSU who are making this case in a place where it is hard to make it, harder than here in Vermont where I live. Um, and I'm very much look forward to helping as I can going forward. And I know many others feel the same way. You're about some of the most important work in the world. And right now with the bombs falling in Ukraine, right now with the temperatures skyrocketing in the Antarctic, right now that's more obvious than ever. Getting off fossil fuel is what the world needs to do. And you all can play a big part in making that happen. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bill. Let's give Bill a round of applause. I can't tell if you are already because I'm not saying, but <laughs> yeah. Um, so we're going to start the Q&A portion of this now. The way this is going to work, people have written down note cards. So pass those to the end of the rows and people in person will have those collected and then read out loud by uh, Jacob and Atticus and Zach. And then for the people online, keep sending your questions into the chat. And we're going to alternate between uh, online and in-person questions. We have our first question lined up already. We've received so many comments in the chat about hope. So we wanted to ask, when confronted by all this news, how do you keep the motivation up and continue working on hard tasks? Well, very good question. I, I'll confess that not every single day do I feel super hopeful. I mean, the name of the first book about all this that I wrote back in 1989, the cheerful title was The End of Nature. So I'm not always, you know, glibly optimistic. But, but, Two things really give me hope. One is the remarkable fall in the price of renewable energy. The scientists and engineers have done their job. All that we could possibly do and that formed the possibilities over the last decade. I don't think everybody's quite realized this yet. Sometimes we still think of solar power and wind power as you know some of the energy of the future or whatever it is. But right now, this is the best and cheapest way to generate power on planet Earth. And of course, Montana uh, has an ample supply. My, my, for many happy months spent wandering around the, uh, 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 the great state of Montana, I'll tell you that uh, one thing that, that that big sky has in spades is wind. Um, there's plenty of it there. And, and, and enough to, to make Montana really a, an energy superpower in this way instead of in the way it is now. The other thing that gives me hope is the fact that people have built big movements um, over the last decade. So many people have come together. I got to kind of help start this process out by starting this thing called 350.org with seven college students here in Vermont and it became the first iteration of a global grassroots climate movement. We've organized 20,000 demonstrations in every country on earth except North Korea. Um, but so many others have flooded into this space. That's been the most beautiful part of it. And most of them young people. The Sunrise Movement, uh, most of whom cut their teeth, the leader, early leaders of whom cut their teeth on uh, campus divestment movements. Varshini Prakash, the executive director at Sunrise Movement, um, um, was the person who uh, uh, divested the University of Massachusetts from fossil fuel almost 10 years ago. Um, 
and and so they're a beautiful example. They're the ones who brought us the Green New Deal, which kind of turned into Biden's Build Back Better bill. Uh, and then even younger people, you know, the junior high and high school students that are uh, doing extraordinary work. You all know the name of Greta Thunberg, and you should. She's great. She's one of my favorite people. I love working with her. But she would be the first to say that the really good news is there are 10,000 Greta Thunbergs scattered around the planet, and they have 10 million followers. And that's fantastic. Youth are really doing a great job. But at a certain point, it began to worry me that we were taking the most difficult problem on the planet and assigning it to, you know, 17 year olds to solve. Like, you know, in between algebra homework and field hockey practice, would you mind saving the world too? And that seemed not only slightly immoral, but also impractical, though they can provide a leadership role. Young people don't have sufficient power to make the change on their own. That's why in the last year, I've been trying to broaden this movement a lot by um, we've organized this thing we're calling Third Act uh, for people over the age of 60. Um, so tell your grandparents about it. Um, um, it's really fun and we're getting a lot of work done trying to back up young people in this work. So those are the things that give me hope, the knowledge that we could change and the fact that millions, hundreds of millions of people are eager for that change to happen. And it's why it makes it all the more sad that it's really only the vested interest of uh, yesterday's technology that keeps us from changing at the pace we need to. Um, these legacy companies, the Exxons and the Chevrons and all the others, uh, are just trying to hold on past when they should to technology that was useful once upon a time, but now is dangerous. Awesome, thank you. So now we're gonna hear from someone in the audience and other questions. Yeah, so this question comes from Emery, who's a junior in environmental health. Um, and the question is, when considering issues as divisive as this, how do you avoid preaching to the choir and reach those who might be resistant to the ideas you present? Very good question. Um, so first of all, preaching to the choir is not unimportant. You know, I say this, not really as a preacher, the highest I've ever risen in the ecclesial hierarchy is Methodist Sunday school teacher. But, I, you know, it's important that the choir all be singing the same um, from the same page in the hymnal and important that they be singing as loudly as possible. So that's part of the work. And, and, and don't worry if you're spending some of your time preaching to the choir because that's important. But you're very right that we need to keep broadening the message all the time. So that's why I'm working a lot with older people who are traditionally have been more conservative as they age, but don't need to be. Um, and we're having great success in changing them. Um, I don't think that we can convert every opponent to climate action. There are a certain number of people for whom this is an ideological thing, um, which is a shame because basically it's just a scientific problem. It shouldn't have anything to do with ideology at all. But, you know, if you've spent the last 30 years listening to Rush Limbaugh every afternoon and things, it's going to be difficult for you to. So I, my advice always to people, like if I'm talking to people in the autumn, especially, I say, don't wreck Thanksgiving dinner trying to argue with your crazy uncle about climate change. He's probably not going to come around. But do sit down next to your sweet aunt who probably is actually quite worried about her grandkids and what the world's going to be look like for them and probably understands that we need to make some changes and try to get her a little more active, you know, pushing um, a little bit, writing some letters, doing the kinds of things that will help change. We work in churches because that's important and churches are increasingly, many of them, able to do this. Uh, uh, the Pope has become a very strong spokesman for climate action, thank you. We work with people who care about national security. The Pentagon has become uh, an outspoken advocate for action on climate change because they understand what a destabilizing force it is. Try to imagine 
a billion climate refugees and what kind of wars and chaos that will produce. And we work with people who care about uh, the economy and the future because they understand the extraordinary opportunities that will be unleashed as we change uh, uh, energy systems. So there's plenty of ways to work with a broad constituencies of people in order to get them on board here. Awesome, thank you. Jesse's gonna ask our next question. Um, yeah, so um, why no mention, this comes from Nick Dreyer um, in the chat, uh, why no mention of nuclear power and only wind and solar? Sure, uh, if you go read this article that I just wrote for the New Yorker, you'll see that I think it's probably a good idea at this point to keep open the nuclear power plants that we have that we can operate with some margin of safety. The reason, because they're producing carbon-free power, the reason that I don't think nuclear power is going to be a huge part of the future has less to do with the safety risks and things, although those are real and not to be avoided, and they were brought into sharp relief by the war in Ukraine. It was not good to see, um, um, you know, firefights going on in the parking lots of nuclear power plants. But the real reason that this is, I think, not going to play a huge role going forward is just that nuclear power is incredibly expensive. Um, uh, many multiples of the cost of solar and wind. And while those have been going on this plummeting cost curve down, down about 90% in the last decade, the price of nuclear energy has actually gone up over the last 10 or 20 years. Now, maybe people will come up with small modular reactors that are cheaper and safer and so on and so forth. And if they do, that may change things. And I pointed out in this New Yorker piece that we do seem to be making slow progress on fusion reactors. And maybe 40 or 50 years hence, we'll be able to take down a lot of the wind turbines and solar panels and put up fusion reactors. But we've got to make huge change in the very short run. It's seven years and eight months till 2030 when the IPCC tells us we have to cut emissions in half. If you started building a nuclear power plant now, it wouldn't be anywhere near done by 2030, but you can put up a wind farm that produces the same amount of power inside of 18 months. So that's the kind of change I think we really need right now. Awesome. Um, back to Zach for a question from the audience. Awesome. This is actually Atticus. I have your next question from uh, Andrew Nosler. And the question is, the spread of misinformation seems like the most nasty virus selling progress and one with few solutions. How do you propose we address and inform a misled public? Well, I mean, that's a very, very good question, Andrew. And I mean, look, I, you know, one does what one can. That's why I write books and articles and that's why I spend a huge amount of my time, you know, talking the way that I'm doing today. When we organize, it becomes a way to spread information. Uh, if you join with the local sunrise movement or whoever it is, they're able to get messages out into the public and it helps. But it is very hard. I, I agree with you. I mean, I think the thing that really maybe the thing that makes it hardest right at the moment is the extraordinary spread of disinformation. And that's why I spent so much time talking about this campaign of uh, dishonesty that, that the fossil fuel industry had engaged and continues to engage in. There are good efforts that people are making, especially young people, to try and clean some of that up. I have old colleagues who are running a campaign called Clean Creatives, trying to get ad agencies and PR firms to stop doing the dishonest greenwashing for the fossil fuel industry. And they're having some real luck. But in a world as, in a country as polarized as ours, um, um, the media, certain parts of the media basically serve the status quo, you know, the vested interests who are the problem. And so that um, level of chatter is always going to be there. The good news is that people have really begun to see through it. We're at the point now where about 70% of Americans 
understand that we have a serious problem with climate change. 70% is actually a lot to get Americans to agree on anything. Mm -hmm. And the reason is partly because we've organized these big movements, but it's also because, well, because Mother Nature is a good educator. I mean, at a certain point, who are you going to believe? You know, you look out the window and, and there's the forest is on fire. You're going to believe Fox News or your own lying eyes, you know? Um, um, and and more than 90% of uh, American counties have had a federally declared uh, disaster in weather disaster in the last couple of years. At a certain point, that adds up. So I worry a little less about the level of misinformation and a little more about the levels of just inactivity on the part of people who do know that there's a problem. I think most people, and I would bet most people in the administration at MSU, understand that we're facing a very, very serious problem. It's just more comfortable not to really do anything about it for the moment, um, to just kind of stand pat. And that's what really worries me more, I got to say, Andrew. So uh, another question getting at the geopolitical and social aspect of this. Can you comment on the geopolitical and social justice aspects of the critical minerals and materials needed for current solar and wind technologies? Are we yes. creating one sustainable future for another? Right. Very good question. Um, the best answer is there is no free lunch on energy and its environmental impacts. Uh, only lunch that costs more or costs less. Um, um, we can't provide energy at the scale that 8 billion humans are currently demanding it or anything like it without having big effects on the world around us. So if we're going to build solar panels and wind turbines and batteries, we're going to need to be mining lithium and cobalt and so on. We can and should do everything we can to make sure that that mining is as benign as possible um, and that it does as little human rights damage as possible, but it's probably not going to be perfect. So the question is, how does it compare to what we have at the moment? The way to think about this for me is to understand the fundamental difference between fossil fuel and renewable energy. You do need to mine, say, lithium to get to, to build your solar panel or your battery, but you only need to do it once. Once you've built the solar panel and put it up, then for the next 25 or 30 years, the sun delivers the energy every day when it rises above the horizon. That's different from coal because coal or gas or oil, you dig up and then you set it on fire and it burns up and then you have to go um, um, dig up some more the next day. So the guess is the best estimates I've been able to find, and I put these in this New Yorker article last month, uh, are that the total mining burden on the planet, the total amount of mining on the planet, would go down about 80% in a renewable energy world. A, a good illustration of that is the fact that 40%, 40% of all the ship traffic in the world is just carrying coal and gas and oil around from one place to another to burn it. That's pretty amazing. You could get rid of almost half the ships in the sea uh, uh, if you just switch to renewable energy, because you need a ship once to take the wind turbine blade across the ocean if it was going across the ocean, but then it would be there catching the breeze for decades to come. The other thing to remember when one thinks about social justice and the impacts of all of this, for those 9 million people a year dying from breathing the combustion products of fossil fuel, 9 million is ungodly amount of people to be killing every year for no good reason. Um, and so I, I, I can't figure out a math way of doing the math that doesn't mean that we're far, 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 far better off getting off fossil fuel. Well said. Um, back to the audience for another question. Thanks, Haley.
So, Bill, this question comes from Lisa in environmental engineering. And Lisa asks, approximately what percent of universities that held stock in these fossil fuel companies have divested? Are these institutions now reinvesting in renewables to some degree? Uh, to answer the second question first, yes, there's a lot of reinvestment in renewables going on, in part because it's the right thing to do, but also in part because it's where there's money to be made. Um, and so there's lots of investment activity. I don't know the percentage precisely of universities that have divested, although it's quite high. More than half of the universities in the UK have divested at this point. And in this country, um, a very high percentage of the elite leading universities have done this job. Um, um, most of the Ivy League uh, and University of California, and as I said, University of Michigan, which strikes me in some ways as most analogous to MSU of the places that have divested, a place with a real stake in the kind of legacy industries, the internal combustion engine in their case, but able to see the future and understanding that their commitment to science and engineering uh, is undercut if they're still um, if they're still embroiled in the technologies of the past. Awesome. Um, we have time for another question from online. Okay, so this next question is from Preston. It says, how hopeful does Bill feel about the UN climate conferences with COP26 happening last November and COP27 happening in about six months? It seems like climate problems should be a lot closer to being solved. And then follow, followed up with what roles we play in making sure that conferences like COP27 have actual results. Well, these are these annual UN conferences. Truthfully, I'm not sure how much faith to be put in the UN, in the UN's ability to get stuff done at this point. I think the high water mark of this process may have come at, at the meeting in Paris in 2016 when we signed those Paris Accords. Um, the big meeting last year in Glasgow did not go well, and it didn't go well in large part because there are fewer and fewer countries that are democratically able to respond to this challenge. The U.S. was back in the game because Biden had replaced Trump, who had taken America out of the whole process. But Biden didn't couldn't bring anything to that meeting because Joe Manchin had blocked his climate plans. And so that sort of helped the meeting fizzle from the beginning. But there were a lot of other countries where democracy is hard to come by now. Brazil, Russia, uh, uh, China, um, increasingly India on these issues. Um, and so I, I'm not sure. I It's one of the reasons why I spend so much of my time concentrating on moving not politics, but finance, on trying to get Wall Street ahead of Washington and other capitals here. because. Um, because most of the money in the world is still in places where we can try and affect it. New York, Chicago, London, Bonn, Tokyo, uh, places where we really still can put pressure on. And also because if change comes in those places, it can come much more quickly than in politics. If, you know, tomorrow, uh, Citibank and J.P. Morgan Chase said, we're going to stop lending to the fossil fuel industry. Well, people would know that in every stock market in the world inside half an hour, and the world would be a different place. So uh, although I think political action is very important and work hard on it, I think we need to be pulling this other lever just as hard, the one marked finance. And that's why this divestment campaign has been so important. Okay, and then we have time for another question from the audience as well. Cool. So this next question, um, I'm not sure who it comes from, but it says, how do you incentivize corporations like Exxon to move on from fossil fuels? 
or should companies like this be disbanded altogether? I don't think that they're going to move on from fossil fuels. Everything we can tell is that they're just doubling down over and over and over again. That's what their skill set is. And it's very, they, they know the history of economics enough to know that it's very rare for the incumbent industry to be able to make the transition to the new technology. The companies that were big on building carriages for horses were not the companies that became the big car companies. The same with cell phones or almost any other you know, big revolutionary technology. I don't think that Exxon's going to be able to do it with renewable energy. And I think the reason fundamentally is they don't like the business model. They got rich by making us pay every month for a new delivery of oil or coal or gas. For them, the idea that you would put a solar panel up and then the energy would get delivered for free every morning is the stupidest business plan ever. Yeah, you can make some money putting up the solar panel, but you can't make Exxon level money. And that's why they're doing everything they can to stop it. That's why they're, you know, hiring congressmen by the score to to block things. So I think that we're going to have to do what we can to dramatically reduce the power of these companies as fast as we can. Even they know that their future is not that bright. Everyone knows that 50 years from now, the world's going to run on sun and wind because it's free. But if it takes us 50 years to get there, which is what Exxon wants, then the world we run on sun and wind will be a broken world. So our job, and this is a good place to end, um, um, our job is to speed up that transition. And divestment is one of the steps that we can take to dramatically speed up that transition. On the list of things that people have to do to deal with climate change, it's really not that hard. I mean, there are tens of millions of people around the world who are having to leave their homes and you know, move to a slum on the edge of the capital city uh, or, or figure out how to feed their family in the middle of a drought or whatever it is. Compared to that, you know, MSU telling their investment advisors to take the money out of oil and gas and put it somewhere else doesn't rank very hard on very high on the spectrum of difficult things. But it'll be a lot of work to get them to do it, which is why I'm extraordinarily grateful to you all for being willing to put in that work. And even if we don't win immediately this fight, it's effort well put in. Divestment is one of these things where we win even when we're losing because it provides a constant way to be raising to people over and over again the fact that these companies have become, in essence, rogue companies. If they are able to follow their business plan, if they're able to dig up as much coal and gas and oil as they've told their shareholders and banks that they plan to, if they can do that, well, the end of this story is written and the temperature is going to go up three degrees Celsius and we are going to be in an unbelievable world of hurt. So our job is to change that story and divestment is a powerful way to do that. Thank you so much, all of you, for being on the forefront of this work. Well, that leads perfectly to our last question. Yeah, so um, what role do students play in changing the culture of university investing? Students are the key here, although making sure that they align with faculty and as many alumni as possible is also really key. Um, a university is a community. A university should not be a, a, a kind of corporation run for the benefit of its administrators. It should be a community that's about learning and about change as we learn, about change that reflects what we've learned. And so students, by constantly reminding the powers that be, the administrators uh, and so on, uh, um, of what they, what it is that we need to do, of how things are changing, are crucial here. Um, they're the moral authority in a lot of ways, because as I said, you'll have to live with these results for a very long time, but you're also the driving engine of change. Look, um, old people get used to doing things a certain way. 
So for us, many of us, a world that runs on fossil fuel seems not just normal, but almost inevitable. What other way could there be? But you are of an age that you can see where that change is coming and help push us in new directions and push us fast. In the name of justice, in the name of uh, good economic sense, um, in the name of survival. Um, these are all powerful reasons that you can summon, and I know you will, and, um, and you have allies the world over who are working on this um, and succeeding with it. So take strength from that, just as they take strength from watching you all, knowing that you're operating in a place near the center of the fossil fuel industry where it's hard and where you deserve all the more credit for doing the work that you're doing. So thank you. Phil, thank you so much for joining us and thank you everyone for coming. Um, we are so grateful for you to share this afternoon with us and educate and mobilize students and citizens alike. Um, we did record this event for anyone that missed it or wants to review some of the things we talked about. And if you want more information on the Campus Climate Coalition or any of the stuff happening with divestment at the university right now, you can go to divestmsu.org. Thank you so much, everyone. All right. And Bobcats. Then, uh, go Bobcats. Take care, y'all. Bobcats. Thanks.